So for those who don't know me, I'm Bev Postma, CEO of Harvest Plus, and I have the honor of introducing our speakers today, as well as providing a short introduction to our new strategic plan. As you know, Harvest Plus was launched uh, in 2004 as a CJR challenge program on biofortification. Since then, it has made the most tremendous progress. As we now prepare to celebrate our 15th anniversary next year, we've taken this opportunity to pause and reflect on what we have achieved and what we've learned. Over the last 12 months, we commissioned an in-depth analysis of what has worked and what hasn't, and what we need to do in the next 12 years if we are to play our small part in meeting the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, 2030, and to help to eradicate hidden hunger once and for all. In coming weeks, we will be sharing our five-year strategy with all key stakeholders and seeking your feedback on what we need to learn from you. We've already shared this with our closest CJR partners and donors, and we're indebted to them for their ongoing support. We simply cannot scale up biofortification and reach 1 billion people by 2030 without your ongoing partnership, your expertise, and your support. One thing is abundantly clear to anyone who spends time with Harvest Plus, whether it's here in DC, in our research base in Colombia, or with any one of our 12 country teams in the field. Harvest Plus draws from the broad talent pool from within the CGR to bring together a unique mix of disciplines in economics, crop science, nutrition, and communications. By creating this healthy tension between these complex sciences, <coughs> Harvest Plus has replicated and nurtured this cross-disciplinary environment that is so critical to success. Howdy Buis was the first to use, see the value of this campus-style collaboration when he originally posed the idea, back in the 90s, of using an agricultural innovation to solve a health challenge. Thanks to Howdy's pioneering work and the partnerships that have been formed in the last 14 years, Harvest Plus has been able to break silos between agriculture and nutrition and is now helping to solve one of the world's biggest social challenges. As we move into the scaling phase of our journey to embed biofortification into the global food chain, one of the hardest tasks of the last 12 months has been deciding where to prioritize our limited resources and where to rely on other partners to coordinate this scale up. There is no single or easy formula to draw from. When it comes to selecting where to work first, it means we have to select who to exclude. To that end, and to, to give you a sense of just how complex and how challenging this difficulty is, this, this problem was, I have the greatest admiration and respect for the team of dedicated researchers who have applied themselves at Harvest Plus to this most difficult task. I'm humbled to introduce you to two members of this team who have led this work. They will be the first to say that this has been a huge team effort, and together to thank everyone who has contributed to this work, most notably the members of our program advisory committee and the leaders of our parent institutes at SEAT and IFPRI. I'm sure you will agree as we lift the hood on some of this complex on some of the complexity of this work, you'll see the rigor and dedication of this team and agree that they have kept to the highest tenets of science when applying these principles. To that end, I'm delighted to introduce you first to Dr. Wolfgang Pfeiffer, Director of Research and Development and Chief Scientific Officer at Harvest Plus. Wolfgang Pfeiffer, or Wolf to his friends, needs very little introduction to this CGR audience. He's a highly regarded scientist with more than 30 years in crop improvement, commercialization, and international agricultural policy. Wolf has been with Harvest Plus for more than 12 years, serving in a variety of leadership capacities. During this time, 
Wolf has led Harvey's Plus through the initial phases of gene discovery, product development, and commercialization, while expanding and growing our organizational capacity. Under his direction, Harvest Plus has developed and released more than 175 biofortified varieties of key staple crops in over 30 countries. Wolf has also established country teams and created strategies to deliver seed and food products under various social, commercial, and mixed marketing situations in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Wolf's experience includes working with a very wide range of crops, including rice, wheat, maize, cassava, beans, palmillet, banana plantain, cowpea, Irish potato, lentil, and sorghum, and I'm sure I've missed some. Wolf received his PhD and MSc in Agricultural Sciences and his Bachelor in Agricultural and Economics from the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Today, he leads our global research team and continues to drive the development, delivery, and commercialization of biofortified crops through collaboration with over 200 partners in 50 countries. We will hear from Wolf after the main presentation. Our other presenter today, Mr. Keith Lividini, joined Harvest Plus in July 2010. Keith's initial work focused on the optimal micronutrient portfolio study a project designed to examine the most cost-effective combinations of three primary micronutrient interventions, biofortification, fortification, and supplementation. Keith has since been involved in all aspects of ex-ante research at Harvest Plus, including examining the cost-effectiveness of target country crop combinations, investigating the impact of policy-relevant applications, and participating in interdisciplinary and interinstitutional uh, collaborations to better understand nutrition security on a global scale. Currently, Keith heads up our strategy and policy research unit at Harvest Plus, where he continues to lead both ex ante research as well as ex post research on the adoption of biofortified crop varieties. Keith is a valuable member of our monitoring and evaluation functional team and leads his own research team on the development and tracking and forecasting models that link monitoring data with projections of biofortifications implementation and impact. Prior to joining Harvest Plus, Keith held various research positions at Tufts University School of Medicine, Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. He holds an MSc in Nutritional Epidemiology and Master in Public Health in Epidemiology and Biostatistics from Tufts, as well as a BS in Biochemistry from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and, and State University. On top of all of that, and in addition to a very busy day job, Keith is a doctoral candidate in Food Policy and Applied Nutrition at Tufts University. Please join me in welcoming Keith as he presents the aptly titled impossible science of country prioritization. Thank you, Keith. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bev, for that great introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to many of you online. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Keith Lodigini, and it's really great to be here today, uh, uh, along with uh, Wolfgang Pfeiffer and other members of the leadership team at Harvest Plus, get a chance to present to you uh, the process that we've gone through for the country prioritization uh, that's associated uh, with Harvest Bus's most uh, recent five-year strategy. Sixty countries currently have crops that are either in the pipeline, in testing, or that have already been released. Currently, Harvest Plus is moving from a situation in which we were previously working with eight what were previously called target countries in which we were prioritizing our activities for scaling biofortification to now working with a greater set of countries. However, it was decided that in order to do this, an important trade-off was required and that Harvest Plus would not be able to work with all countries uh, that have activities ongoing currently for biofortification. And it was decided that uh, Harvest Plus must actually work in a phased approach in order to, to successfully scale biofortification. 
Therefore, 30 countries uh, have been prioritized uh, for, uh, for this five-year uh, strategic plan. And so I decided that I would cut right to the punchline right away and, and present to you the results, and you're seeing an overall map of those 30 countries here. In Africa, we have, uh, we're prioritizing 18 countries. So the primary crops are maize, cassava, and sweet potato. Uh, additionally, in, in West Africa, pearl millet is a very important crop. Additionally, in East and South Africa, banana is a very important crop, and beans as well are, are, is additionally a very important crop. In Asia, we're prioritizing eight countries. Uh, rice and wheat are the dominant crops in this region. And the primary focus here is on zinc deficiency. However, we continue to, to also focus and prioritize vitamin A and iron deficiency as well. In Latin America, we're focusing on four countries. Again, the, the primary dominant crops here are maize, rice, and beans. However, in areas such as uh, Brazil, with a wide agroecological variation, it really offers the ability to, uh, to introduce a number of biofortified crops to address micronutrient deficiencies. So what does this mean for countries that are not on the prioritized list? Well, first of all, it's very important to understand that these countries are not forgotten and not left behind. It's really important to understand that we're considering this approach in terms of working, country, working with countries in a phased manner. Not that those countries are overall excluded, but rather we're prioritizing activities in a particular set of countries to begin with, and other countries that are not currently on the prioritized list are likely to be phased in in the next five-year strategy. In addition, Harvest Plus has committed to setting aside 10% of its operation, uh, operations budget to work with those additional countries that see a particular opportunity in implementing uh, a particular crop and starting to bring those to scale. In addition, Harvest Plus is very ready and willing to, uh, to offer technical assistance, know-how, guidelines, etc., to the UN system, to financial institutions, to central statistical offices, and will continue to do so. So I want to talk a little bit uh, now about uh, and give you just a, a brief overview of the prioritization process. So the process first began uh, with development of initial criteria, and these criteria included uh, using uh, current indices that we have at, at Harvest Plus, such as, such as the Biofortification Priority Index, uh, to understand where uh, particular micronutrient need and opportunities were, uh, to look at existing cost-effectiveness data, uh, to consider existing operations, partnerships, uh, availability of planting material, funding availability, and a host of other factors as well. So utilizing this information, we developed uh, an initial list of countries uh, to be prioritized. And with that information, uh, we then carried that forth and shared that information with a greater uh, set of people throughout Harvest Plus with members of our program, program advisory committee, or PAC, uh, as well as uh, other co collaborators. We gathered their information and their feedback, and then we went through a revision process. So what was the role of the Strategy and Policy Research Unit uh, within this prioritization process? So the Strategy and Policy Research Unit was uh, really responsible for uh, applying, for revising a set of existing tools and utilizing a set of tools to apply a systematic approach to this process so that we could lend to the, the cache of information and the decision-making process uh, that was going on. So I want to highlight uh, just briefly a couple of uh, indexes that we used as part of this process. So first, we use the Biofortification Priority Index, or BPI. And in brief, the BPI is an index that brings together information on biofortifiable crop production, uh, crop consumption, and micronutrient deficiency to identify countries uh, that are suitable for implementing biofortification. Similarly, We've been developing at Harvest Plus what's called the Biofortification Multi-Crop Index. And this multi-crop index 
uses uh, a somewhat similar approach as the BPI, but attempts to actually include a greater set of biofortifiable crops and bring together uh, three micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A, zinc, and iron into one index. In addition, we lean, we lean on the Hunger and Nutrition Commitment Index, or HANSI. Now, this index was not developed uh, at Harvest Plus, but was developed uh, by the Institute of Development Studies. And uh, this index uh, measures and ranks countries' commitment to uh, reducing hunger and to nutrition uh, using uh, an existing set of themes uh, associated with public expenditures, existing policies, and laws associated with these. And finally, we developed an index based on our crop readiness, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we move on. So we applied all of these uh, indices in a systematic way, which I'll talk to you a little bit uh, more about, uh, and we gathered a host of information. We collated that information. Uh, we applied some additional criteria, and we submitted uh, this information to the leadership team for final decisions. So the objective of the index application uh, that we applied was to utilize a set of indexes to identify countries with high potential to address significant, significant micronutrient intake gaps within country through domestic production of biofortifiable crops. And this was geared towards Harvest Plus's approach of targeted delivery, and then also exhibit favorable conditions for implementation. And that term, favorable conditions for implementation, I'll discuss a little bit more as well. So now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more in, in detail and in depth about the, the different indexes before uh, going into how exactly they were applied. So the first is the biofortification priority index. So the, the, the BPI uh, uh, creates and brings together a number of sub-indices sub that identify conditions for biofortification investments. The first is that a country uh, produces the biofortifiable crop, and this is captured in the production sub-index. The next condition is that within a country, the population consume much of the biofortifiable crop on a per capita basis, and this is captured by the consumption sub-index. And the third is that within a country, there's a high level of micronutrient deficiency, and this is captured by the micronutrient deficiency sub-index. All of these come together to form the BPI. So now gearing, uh, shifting gears to talk a little bit about the, the sub-indices, and I'll try to be uh, uh, quick and concise uh, with respect to these. So the pr production sub-index measures the intensity of biofortifiable crop production. So three important variables are utilized in this sub-index. The first is the per capita area harvested within a country. The next is the share of cultivated land area that's specifically allocated to that biofortifiable crop. And the last is the export share. And the export share is very important here because, again, we're prioritizing <coughs> countries that utilize and that focus on production to be, to be used and consumed directly within the country. All of the data uh, are country-level data uh, that we access from FAO uh, in terms of the most up-to-date uh, accessible data. So the formula for the pro uh, production sub-index is shown here, and you can see that the, uh, the export share uh, is taken into account for a country with a high export share. This will lead to a lower value in the production sub-index. And then uh, for the per capita area harvested and the land area allocated to the crop, these are combined uh, in equal weight. And all of these components, because uh, they all have different units, are rescaled before uh, they're combined within the production sub-index. The, con the consumption sub-index is shown here. And the consumption sub-index measures the magnitude of per capita consumption, again, of the biofortifiable crop, which is supplied by domestic production. The variables are per capita consumption uh, of the crop, uh, uh, presented in kilograms per capita year, uh, per year. And again, the import share, and this is a very important uh, component of this, uh, of this sub-index because again, we're prioritizing countries where the crop is consumed within the country in order to combat micronutrient deficiency. And so here, where there's a high percentage, a high import share, uh, this will result in a low value uh, for a country's consumption sub-index. 
And in situations where the production minus exports either have a zero or negative value, uh, uh, as an assumption, the, the percentage of imports are assumed to be 100%. So now for the BPI, again, the BPI focus on, focuses and ranks countries for a particular crop and micronutrient deficiency. Um, but that being said, I will discuss what uh, each of the different uh, micronutrient deficiency sub-indices are, which will be employed for uh, different uh, crop-specific BPIs. So the first is the vitamin A uh, deficiency sub-index, and this describes the, the extent of vitamin A deficiency. The variables are the proportion of preschool-aged children with vitamin A deficiency, and in addition, in order to consider the, the entire magnitude of the burden of vitamin A deficiency, we utilize uh, the age standardized dollies uh, associated with vitamin A deficiency. Again, we use all of the most up-to-date country-level data from WHO. And these two indicators are uh, combined uh, in equal weighting within this uh, sub-index. The iron deficiency sub-index uh, is created very similarly to the vitamin A sub, uh, sub de uh, deficiency sub-index, and the variables are the proportion of preschool-aged children uh, uh, with anemia, and again, uh, the age standardized dollies associated uh, with iron deficiency anemia. The zinc deficiency sub-index, uh, again, is created similarly to the other two. However, uh, for this sub-index, uh, DALIs specifically associated with zinc deficiency are not calculated and reported. So the variables we use are the percentage of the population at risk of inadequate zinc intake, and this captures the entire population, and the prevalence of stunting among children under five, uh, also used uh, as a proxy for zinc deficiency. And the data for this sub-index uh, are country-level data that come from iZinc uh, published data, as well as the WHO. Here's the final uh, calculation of the BPI and how these different sub-indices uh, come together. Now the production sub-index and the consumption sub-index are interrelated, and so these are combined first using a geometric mean. And the final index, again, uh, is combined uh, using a geometric mean as opposed to an arithmetic mean. And the, and the simple reason why is that there's an interdependency uh, here between these. If we were to use an arithmetic mean, then any one of the sub-indexes could, uh, could really influence the final score of the BPI, um, but that could result in countries where uh, any one of the sub-indices were high, say production, production or consumption or micronutrient deficiency, without having all of those conditions come together. And here's a reference to the Harvest Plus BPI tool online. In terms of the multi-crop index, so again, this is created similarly to the BPI. So again, we identify conditions for biofortification investments. And it's, this is structured a little bit differently because the sub-indices here now are, are focused on consumption deficiency sub-indices. So the first is that a population consumes a set of biofortifiable vitamin A crops and has high levels of vitamin A deficiency. And this is captured in the vitamin A sub-index. The next is that a population consumes biofortifiable zinc-related crops and has a high level of zinc deficiency captured in the zinc sub-index. And the last is that a, a population consumes uh, uh, biofortifiable iron crops and also has a high level of iron deficiency, and this is captured in the iron sub-index. And these come together to create the biofortification multi-crop index. The vitamin A sub-index uh, sub describes the potential, again, to address vitamin A deficiency through per capita consumption of domestically produced crops. So domestically produced, so this is very similar uh, to the idea behind the BPI. So in terms of the variables, this first one uh, is, is a new variable. NVAD stands for net vitamin A deliverable through uh, consumption of these biofortifiable crops. And for this uh, indicator, we calculate the net per capita vitamin A that can be delivered from all biofortifiable uh, crops that are under consideration within the index. Uh, we use uh, two metrics associated with vitamin A deficiency, and that's the proportion of children under five with vitamin A deficiency and the proportion of pregnant women with vitamin A deficiency. 
the data that began are country level data that can be accessed uh, from FALSTAT and the WHO or the World Bank. Uh, and the vitamin A subindex uh, is, uh, is brought together in the following way. First, uh, there's an interrelated uh, nature between uh, the uh, deficiency variables, and so these are, are combined using a geometric mean. And finally, again, to ensure that uh, uh, not only one, either the, uh, a high ability to deliver biofortifiable uh, uh, crops and additional vitamin A, or micronutrient deficiency drive it, these are combined uh, using a geometric mean. The zinc subindex uh, is created in a very similar way, so it describes the potential to address uh, zinc deficiency through per capita consumption of domestically produced crops. Uh, the net uh, zinc deliverable is, is, uh, is created uh, very much like uh, the deliverable variable for vitamin A. And for the vitamin A deficiency, we use a proxy, and that's the prevalence of stunting among children under five. The iron subindex is created uh, just like the other two. So we calculate uh, the net amount of iron that can be delivered uh, through biofortifiable crops. Uh, for deficiency indicators, we use the proportion of preschool-aged children uh, with anemia and the proportion of non-pregnant non women. The iron subindex, just like before, is, is calculated the same as the vitamin A uh, and zinc uh, index. Now, the final score for the multi-crop index is calculated a little bit differently from the BPI, and that is that the three subindices are combined, and we use uh, an arithmetic mean uh, to determine the final result. And that the reason why is because we don't put uh, you know a necessity uh, on a or a condition on a country that they have to have high conditions for addressing all three micronutrient uh, deficiencies. So a country uh, that has the ability to address one particular uh, micronutrient deficiency is allowed to, to drive the final uh, index value. So the BPI and, and the MCI are utilized, and you'll see this in, in a moment, to characterize uh, uh, what we're looking to investigate as the overall benefit of investing in biofortification in, uh, in these various countries. Now we use these other two indicators, uh, first the HANSI and also the crop readiness, to estimate uh, what we sometimes refer to as the pain or, or really more uh, you know, aptly uh, uh, considered as the enabling factors um, for implementing biofortification. And the HANSI is shown here. And so the HANSI brings together uh, a number of indicators uh, focused around different themes for two different sub-indices. These sub-indices are, are the Hunger Reduction Commitment Index, or the HRCI, and the Nutrition Commitment Index, or NCI. And so for the HRCI, there are 10 indicators uh, that are associated with, again, as I mentioned before, public spending, policies, and laws uh, that are related to these. And for the NCI, there are 12 different indicators uh, that are related to these, uh, these different themes. Now within theme, these indicators uh, are combined uh, using an unweighted approach, but then across uh, themes, the ANSI uses uh, a weighted uh, approach to, to combining this different information. And all of that comes together uh, to create the Han C, uh, and uh, which results uh, ultimately in a, in a value for each country, and then the values are, uh, the countries are ranked based on their different Han C values. A link to, uh, to, to the Han C index is shown here, and you can find out uh, more about this index. Uh, as well as related uh, publications for this online. So finally, uh, we created a simple index of crop readiness. And crop readiness, uh, this index was basically uh, just made using a simple rank sorting uh, based on the number of crops released during testing. Uh, so first we sorted first on the number of primary crops and release, and the primary crops are rice, wheat, maize, cassava, pearl millet, beans, and sweet potato. And then we next ranked on the number of secondary crops in release, and these are our additional five crops that are now in, in testing. After that, the next order of, uh, of sorting was based on the number of primary crops in testing, and then finally the number of secondary crops in testing. 
We applied population weighting uh, uh, to this process uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a minute. Uh, but basically, to provide population weighting, uh, we created a rescaled uh, index uh, based on the population of all countries. Uh, and then we uh, combined uh, this rescaled uh, population index value with the resulting either BPI or MCI values in an equal manner to create a population weighted result. So now getting into how we apply these indices uh, a little bit. So here we're looking at a schematic for uh, what we were at times calling uh, gain pain. So what is the gain that we get from, uh, from working within a particular country and, and what is the pain associated with that? So what are, uh, you know, is there a lack of enabling factors or thought of another way, what enabling factors are there for, uh, for implementing biofortification within a country? And so on the y-axis, you see the benefit. And so the benefit is characterized uh, by either the, the, the BPI values or the MCI values. And on the x-axis, we have our enabling factors. And these were, these were characterized uh, using the ANSI values or the crop readiness values. Uh, and these values for each of these uh, were combined in a way that I'll explain in a bit. So using this convention, then the upper rightmost uh, area of this grid represented the area <coughs> where countries um, had the greatest amount of benefit to offer and the greatest amount of enabling factors. And so when we were working through the prioritization, we worked in kind of a sweeping uh, motion from the upper right um, and down to the left as we were uh, <coughs> creating our list of prioritized countries. Okay, so how do we bring these, uh, these indices together uh, to apply them to this grid? So first, we estimated the benefit, um, starting with the BPI. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, the BPI is, is comprised of, of a set of different indicators that are uh, crop and micronutrient uh, deficiency uh, specific. And so what we did was we created a, a list of the countries that were the, the top performers uh, in terms of single crop uh, BPIs. And from that list, then, uh, we, uh, we summed the values of each of those countries' uh, BPI values across all seven, uh, seven BPIs that we had for all of our primary crops. From those summed values, we rescaled this information into one final index value. And then we were to use that to plot that on the grid. Next, we estimated. Uh, uh, what we were referring to as the, the enabling factors. So using the Hansi index uh, and the crop readiness, uh, crop readiness index, we use the rankings from each of these indi uh, indices, and we rescale these uh, rankings between 0 and 100. We combine these two indices together, we rescale them once more, and then plotted those on the grid. So each of these benefit and enabling factors were plotted. We then conducted a series of, of rescores or additional scorings or sensitivity analyses. And so for this, we use the multi-crop index. Now as, as I, now, as I mentioned before, the multi-crop index actually allows for uh, restricting the index to be uh, calculated anywhere from a range of only one biofortifiable crop up to an entire set of 12 potentially biofortifiable crops. So we use this to apply a number of different uh, scenarios. So we created for, first an MCI that was uh, as similar as possible to the BPI, in which we limited this to just the seven primary crops. We, we then created uh, a next version in which we, uh, we, in which we calculated the MCI based on the full cache of 12 biofortifiable crops. And then a third condition in which we calculated the MCI just based on crossing testing that countries had in testing and a release. So this gave us three additional scorings, or four in total. And finally, uh, we added, uh, and all of these were calculated based on, based without using any sort of population weighting. So all of these indices were calculated without the consideration of countries' uh, population weights or totals. So we ran through each of these four scenarios one more time using population weighting to create a total of eight different scenarios that we utilized. 
and we plotted uh, with each of these eight scenarios, we plotted each of these out, uh, creating essentially eight different uh, grid results. For, uh, from these results, we flagged countries for review. These were countries that continuously popped up uh, in terms of prioritization uh, under each of these different scenarios. We then applied additional uh, criteria to uh, these considerations in these lists, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then we, present, we presented these final results uh, to leadership team for final decision making. So it's important to talk about a couple of limitations. First, there's no perfect index. So we sat down and, and we had a lot of discussions about this. We talked to collaborators, we talked to members of the, of the PAC, um, and, and this was something that we, we very well understood, and that's that you can't create an index that captures all of the different criteria and scenarios that one uh, would want to and need to uh, include uh, to go through uh, such a process. Because of that, it was one of the reasons that really prompted us to use a number of different uh, conditions and scenarios in order to do this. So our approach was to gather as, as much information, to flag uh, what continuously uh, popped up, and, to, and then to utilize that to make our final decisions. With respect to, uh, to our indices, there are some important drawbacks. Uh, so in terms of the multi-crop uh, index, uh, it doesn't in particular take uh, direct account of cost, and this is also true of the BPI. Now, these, uh, these indices are created in such a way in which uh, uh, implicitly and intuitively these conditions would actually maximize the conditions for cost effectiveness. So prioritizing countries with high production, high consumption, high micronutrient uh, deficiency all are, uh, represent conditions for high cost effectiveness. But this is something that's important to keep in, uh, in mind. Again, probability of delivery success is not uh, directly taken into account. What is delivery infrastructure like in a particular country? What other factors might affect the ability to, to implement uh, and successfully deliver? You know, are there mar uh, appropriate market conditions for being able to scale the biofortifiable crop within a particular country? And again, in particular, uh, uh, with respect to the MCI, uh, the number of crops being introduced is definitely a factor. So for the BPI, the BPI focuses on one particular crop, but for the MCI, it considers uh, uh, a cache of potential biofortifiable crops. And this can actually uh, work in terms of cost effectiveness uh, in, in one of two ways. Uh, uh, the first is that with a number of crops, you could see a high level of redundancy, and this actually might um, introduce a condition which is less cost effectiveness. At the same time, introducing multiple uh, crops might allow you greater coverage and a greater ability to, to address micronutrient deficiency within a country. And so this is a particular country, uh, or, or uh, situation that the MCI doesn't specifically tease out. Very important to recognize uh, that the BPI and MCI do not account specifically for regional variation. Uh, but we have uh, other ongoing uh, work, extensive work at, at Harvest Plus that we're doing uh, in which uh, we're, uh, we're researching and creating and investigating a subnational BPI which takes uh, subnational variation into account and identifies areas uh, uh, in particular that are, are most suitable for delivery of biofortifiable crops. And finally, as I mentioned, additional criteria always need to be taken into account. So what are some of these additional criteria? Um, those criteria that can't be captured in, in an index are existing operations. You know, are we already working in countries? What are our, our existing partnerships? What have we already established? What does the varietal pipeline look like? Do we have planting <coughs> material that would be ready? You know, do we have the supply uh, available in order to uh, address the micronutrient needs? Is there particular demand from the government? Do they want it or have they, they prioritized other interventions? Does a country have particular regional importance? And that is, if we introduce biofortification within uh, a particular country, does that uh, position Harvest Plus and its partners to be able to adapt those varieties to other countries uh, in the region and to share uh, and lean uh, on that, that leverage and that importance? Uh, 
and probably not finally, but finally on this list, uh, there's also the consideration of delivery infrastructure. So if we were to prioritize a country, uh, are the conditions there to help us deliver and scale that, uh, uh, that crop? So one last time, we take uh, one more look at the final results. So here are all the 30 countries. Um, and uh, again, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that these 30 countries do not represent the only 30 countries that Harvest Plus will ever prioritize. And that it's important to, to, to really think of this and consider this as a phased approach. Um, with that being said, in terms of some of these other uh, additional considerations, Harvest Plus is continuing to, uh, to work on analyses related to uh, this work. And those analyses are geared towards uh, cost effectiveness um, uh, calculations and studies for each of these different countries, uh, uh, continual development of the subnational BPI, uh, working with uh, other, other partners uh, and institutions to, uh, to research uh, the potential for biofortification moving forward, specifically under um, uh, different socioeconomic scenarios, uh, climate change related scenarios, et cetera, and to be able to utilize and bring that information back into uh, what we continuously do at Harvest Plus. So all of this represents ongoing work uh, that will continue as we move forward. So finally, I'd, I'd like to uh, kind of preempt uh, some initial questions and have one last slide called Why Isn't Country X on the List? Uh, and it's, in terms of this country prioritization, it's, it's typically for one of the following reasons. A, there isn't one obvious staple crop that can generate significant domestic impact if biofortified. Uh, so it might be that a, a, a country just doesn't have either a dominant crop or that it might have uh, a few uh, biofortifiable crops, but they don't contribute significantly to per capita <coughs> consumption. It might be that there are no suitable biofortified varieties that can be released in the next five years. So a country uh, might be a great candidate uh, in terms of uh, having a high represent representation of micronutrient need, uh, uh, strong candidates for biofortifiable crops. But uh, in terms of their development, uh, then uh, those crops might be at least three years away. So we decided that those would be appropriate for the next phasing. A country is too difficult to operate in due to natural or political reasons. So this is always an important consideration um, and, then, and one that we continuously monitor. And finally, um, the funding environment may not be right for being able to prioritize a particular country at, the, uh, at this time. And so again, while, while particular countries might be, uh, or particular conditions might be present, uh, just the funding opportunities aren't there, and so we'll continue to monitor those, fund, uh, those funding opportunities and reconsider uh, countries again as those conditions change. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. Um, uh, before I finish my part, I, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the many people who really contributed to this work, uh, be it researchers within uh, the, uh, the Strategy and Policy Research Unit. Can't thank you enough for all of the great work that has gone into uh, the development of the BPI, the subnational BPI, and all of this other work. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, actually, uh, Michael DeRessi, particularly for uh, his help in formatting this presentation. Uh, and also thank all the, uh, the members of the Program Advisory Committee and our collaborators for really providing us very, very uh, essential feedback uh, throughout the process. Uh, so with that, I thank you, and uh, I welcome up uh, Wolf uh, to join me in Questions. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone who is, who is listening. And uh, I think just a few comments. Uh, as, as Keith mentioned, there is no perfect index, number one. And number two, also, uh, not all these uh, criteria have been elaborated and new criteria are already. And uh, not all of those have, have been listed. And as you also know, varieties can be released, but they may not be adopted because there is no value proposition, not only for the farmers, but for all those engaged along the value chain, which is key. And then suddenly, once the varieties are out, there could be a drawback. You get maize, weasel, necrosis disease in, in Africa, or you get 
last and we in Bangladesh. So we have to uh, always uh, revisit and, and, and reconsider then. I think this is a first start and in my personal biased opinion, I think it is as good as it gets. And uh, sure, once we reach uh, in interacting with, with our partners, the public, private sector, consensus, then again we can take it to the next level. For example, then use more sophisticated methods, use, for example, linear optimization, again, and put in what we are still not could accomplish completely, put in some cost factors. I think with that I would open the floor for questions or, or you would have first some of the clarifying questions. Uh, thanks very much. That was very interesting. My name is Frank Place. I'm with the PIM program here, it's a sister program, <laughs> program here hosted by you. Pretty awesome. I had a question, two, two quick questions. One is the number 30. Did that come a priori based on expected resources you would have or did, is that what fell out of your analysis ex post? So that's one question. And then the second one is the regional balance between Africa and Asia and Latin America. Did you have some, again, wanted to have impose some kind of balance uh, ge geographically on, on those uh, continents? I mean, we certainly we didn't want to come up with sure, the countries or our number. I mean, it's just the way it came out. I mean, initially, I think in the very first part, we had 27. And then finally, it turned out to be 30. Now about the balance between Africa Asian Latin America. And we have to go back a little bit in Harvest Plus in, in the history and, and initially all the funding. Uh, we had one major donor, the Bill and the, the Gates Foundation, was all focused on Africa initially. There was no investment from our major donor in Latin America. And so we were first to you know, uh, uh, we had first products, first varieties released in Africa, and then later in at a later stage, then in Asia and now at a little stage of getting that in America, that's the reason. <coughs> One of the country X that, uh, that Keith uh, made allusion to that is not in the list and still baffles me why it didn't make it into the list and it's perhaps because of the uh, uh, political environment or the lack of infrastructure but it's still a, a, a very needy country and that's Haiti. Um, Haiti has a you know a high uh, prevalence of stunting and undernutrition, um, micronutrient deficiency in general. Uh, it's an agriculture-based economy, uh, and uh, and it was previously included in the original list, but then it uh, was dropped together with Nicaragua from this list. Uh, well, Nicaragua has its own resources, but Haiti doesn't. So, what was the basic parameter that uh, you know? Uh, resulted in a lower score for Haiti. Maybe we can share the, the response to this. So in terms of the, uh, the application of the, the index work, um, you're right, Eric, uh, <clears throat> Haiti was captured uh, in all of these index values. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a country with high micron, uh, micronutrient need. Uh, there are biofortifiable crops uh, that could address uh, micronutrient deficiency within uh, Haiti, and it does score quite well. Uh, on a number of these uh, these index values, so this was flagged. This was uh, included uh, <clears throat> as as part of the results and submitted to the leadership team. Uh, ultimately, there there were additional criteria and, and conditions. Uh, again, for you know, it, it's important to, to to think of it not in terms of excluding, but uh, but considering Haiti uh, to be prioritized within the next phase. And with that, uh, I'll pass that to Wolf. We know, uh, we know you. The, the issues in Haiti, and so we are currently, we have high seed rice, we have vitamin A cassava, we have high iron beans, all, and maize, vitamin A maize, also been testing in Haiti. Uh, there are other uh, partners working in Haiti, and so we don't want to, to uh, duplicate, you know, but we have been uh, working together and interacting with those partners. And should funding be available, then we are ready to include, uh, I think Haiti can be included. It has a kind of a special status. So we are testing and I think probably by the end of the year, we would know whether it would qualify to be included or not. 
Thank you very much, Wolf and Keith. I have a question from Ruben Echeverria, um, DG of SEAT. And as you know, he played a, an early role in guiding us on this, uh, this selection process. Ruben, unfortunately, has been able to, to stay online. Um, but he has a question. Um, what has changed since you first started this process? We presented a list of, I think, 27 countries to at the very early stages of this mapping exercise uh, back in January last year. And you've since embarked on a very rigorous process. And, and Ruben would like to know what, what has changed as a result of that process and what did you learn as a result of those changes? Hi, Ruben. Thank you very much uh, for, that, for that question. Again, thank you for, for being really integral to this process and, and providing all of your feedback. Um, you know, it's really been helpful as we've, we've gone through this. Uh, so you know, I, I think in terms of uh, what has changed, um, I, I think uh, the most important thing that is uh, change is really associated with, uh, with the process itself. Now, initially, when we uh, originally embarked on this, we, uh, we had gathered uh, a set of criteria utilizing a number of different resources that we had. Um, and we kind of combined all of this uh, to say, uh, to be able to flag countries. Oh, this is, this is great here for this reason, this is great here for this reason, and, and so on and so forth, and to, and to really bring that, uh, that information uh, together to, to create our initial list of countries. Um, now, one of the other important considerations of all of this was what are the enabling factors uh, you know, to, to implementing within a country? And so for that, um, we, we utilized a, an initial approach based on uh, creating um, some, some uh, uh, not indices, but scales that were a little bit more subjective. And so uh, we were trying to consider uh, a number of, of different factors that are actually all um, you know, systematically included uh, now in the Hansi, you know, as well as the, the Crop Readiness Index. Uh, but we were really trying to, to employ a little, a little bit more intuitively. And so that was really one of the, the things that we really changed throughout this process, uh, was that we, we employed the use of these uh, index values in a much more systematic way so that we were, were less going with uh, our gut feeling in, in some uh, cases and really being much more empirically driven uh, in others. Uh, another really key component of that was our use, uh, use of population weighting. Uh, so in, in prior iterations of this, um, we had employed a type of po uh, population weighting that, that basically just scaled the index values by a country's population weight. But we found that that <laughs> tended to over, just overemphasize uh, countries with, uh, with a, a very large uh, population and really to render the, the final index values uh, not obsolete, but really less important. So uh, in, in revising our approach to how we calculated the population weighting, um, this really uh, created a, a situation where we could uh, really explore a better balance uh, between uh, micronutrient uh, need within a particular country uh, and the consideration uh, of, of total population. Um, so from the, uh, the initial list, uh, you know, it's actually uh, very interesting in that, uh, you know, some of the initial countries, uh, or most of the initial countries on the, on the list, um, you know, we did a good job of, of employing existing criteria to develop. But one of the things that really changed was identifying other opportunities that we were initially missing. You know, uh, uh, countries that had a, you know, high micronutrient need with crops uh, really uh, much more along the line uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of the readiness. And so I think we actually went from an initial list of about uh, 23, 24 countries to the final prioritized list of 30 countries. Uh, I mean, you have answered part of uh, product. You have already answered part of the question I had. Um, so, so the list actually increases from 23 to 30 during a sensitivity analysis, I guess. Uh, so there was not a longer list, actually. It was increased. Is that, and one, and the second one is the population weighted. Uh, was that based on the whole population of the country or the target population of harvest plus? Because that might vary because that environment by country changes, you know, you compare 
compare Latin America, you know, Africa and Asia, the pyramid changes a lot. Yeah, uh, so to answer the first part of your questions, uh, first part of your question, yes, the, the eventual uh, uh, list was, uh, was not reduced, it was actually increased. There were countries that, uh, that the process flagged uh, for uh, countries that uh, could be reconsidered uh, or, or maybe prioritized uh, in a second phasing. But again, that information went to uh, a final decision making process, and once we applied uh, sort of these additional considerations and criteria, uh, for the most part, it was decided to keep uh, many of these countries that were uh, originally on the list. Um, with respect to your, your second question, population weighting, um, right, so one of the, the ways of applying population weighting is to utilize the, the population uh, size, specifically of, of the target population. So that might be children under five, or whatever is specifically associated um, with the deficiency variables that you're, you're utilizing. Um, for, uh, for each of these approaches, um, uh, when we recalculated the population weight, we decided to use the entire population of the country with the idea in mind that while there are particular indicators uh, on deficiency for specific target groups within the, within the population, all populations to some uh, extent, uh, uh, you know, to some extent, suffer from inadequate intakes of, of uh, micronutrients. So we decided to use the entire uh, population for the day. You can also ask specific questions for certain countries. And uh, as Keith mentioned, we had uh, initial target countries, phase one. And those which are part of the five-year harvest plus strategic plan are the phase two countries. And then also we have phase three countries, which then would be, let's say, after uh, uh, 2020 to the next, the next five years. And Keith, Michael, and I, we are currently working on again narrowing down and uh, some projections of which countries would be included in the phase three. But you also can ask question any country uh, on the globe. Uh, when, when we think, uh, give us a give you put a projection and idea, and we think we would uh, be uh, entering. Okay. Yeah. How does the, the list align, generally speaking, with the funding priorities for with different funders? Um, are, you know, do you find like many are there many countries that are you know like not priority for funding or high priority for funding? Mm -hmm. I, I will try to address this, Moraz, and maybe draw on other colleagues for support. As you know, this is an aspiration. This is not a fully funded plan for the next 12 years. As with any uh, research initiative, this is based on the, the best thing to do, and in, in our uh, humble opinions, and also backed with, with, with a huge amount of evidence. The next stage is to match a, a donor aspiration with the, with the science aspiration of, of solving the problem. And as we know, that's where both science and, and subjectivity then come into play. Um, we're very fortunate in our existing donors that they all have a very broad approach and a very evidence-led approach to helping solve this problem. And Wolf has already explained that our existing phase one countries will continue to be prioritized and, and they feature already in the five-year plan. And we're delighted to say that for this year, we're, we're almost fully funded to continue delivery and expansion in those first phase one countries. We're also delighted that our current 2018 plan will allow us to do some limited expansion into the next three of those phase two countries based on, on this evidence. And, and some of that will be funded by our newest donor, the MacArthur Foundation, that you'll, you'll be aware that we were successful in achieving funds from at the end of last year. When it comes to then matching donors with the, the new phase two and hopefully phase three countries, that's where new conversations need to be had. Um, we're very confident that our existing donors will continue the journey with us and we're confident that new donors will will see the value in supporting new phase two countries 
mainly because of the value of this evidence. This is incredibly valuable evidence for donors, both governments and, uh, and philanthropies, that are looking to strategically place their investment in an, uh, in an environment where they'll get the biggest return on, on, those, on those funds. So it's an ongoing journey. Um, I will finish by saying that there are a couple of criteria that the leadership team has agreed are important um, to remember in making decisions. This is just one very important tool in, in making decisions. We are, however, aware that if a single donor came to us with a very strong affinity and alignment to one particular country that's not in this list, or is maybe in a phase three list and not in a phase two list, we will, of course, try to work with that donor to try and develop a plan for that country. Um, if the climate changes, both politically, structurally, or uh, for any reason, up or down, we will reassess this, this regularly to check to see if we need to either rephase a country, move a country, or bring in a new country. This isn't a static instruments. Um, it's a huge amount of work and we can't guarantee we can do it every year, but we will. it will be a dynamic approach. And thirdly, if there is a crisis in a country like Haiti, we will approach this from a humanitarian perspective as well as a scientific perspective. And we work with a huge number of partners around the world, so we can sometimes enable and facilitate some, some very deep and narrow support to solve a very particular problem. And if that crisis is presented to the leadership team on the, the grounds of a humanitarian response, we would like to set aside some of our budget to be able to respond nimbly to those types of humanitarian situations where biofortification can offer um, a piece of the solution in those very desperate times. So those are the three criteria we, we held ourselves open to examining in the next five years um, so that we didn't see this as a rigid tool, but it's a very valuable guide. Thanks for your question. Do we have any more questions online? Aha, uh -huh. let me see if I can read this one. Um, so we have a question from Adewali. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Beyond the varietal releases, the number of primary and secondary crops, how was the operatability defined? Does it also capture other variables reflecting synergies with existing partner operations, trade, and regulatory environments? Well, to answer the first part of it, uh, at all, and thank you very much for, for your question. Um, I think you're, uh, uh, what you're asking uh, uh, is whether there were particular variables associated with uh, operability or, or existing operations that we took into account, um, uh, particularly for this. Uh, and and the, the short answer to that is, is no. Um, I think initially in, in an earlier iteration, we tried to uh, consider uh, some variables uh, associated with that. We considered uh, leaning on the World Bank's uh, ease of doing business uh, index. Um, however, uh, we found that uh, it, 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 many of the variables included in that uh, were not exactly geared towards the conditions that we wanted to consider. So, uh, so we moved on from that in, and instead decided to employ the Hansi. But with respect to um, operability uh, and specifically how those criteria uh, came into account, maybe a little bit more intangibly, I'll pass that to Wolf. I mean, we should look at a political environment, but also then, for example, what we consider, but this is when it comes down to business plans for each country, for example. We have multiple crops. That's the, that's the effectiveness of our, of our delivery operations. What we do in Uganda, for example, what we do in many other countries in Congo, uh, Nigeria is co-delivery. We have several crops which you deliver, like bag of maize and bag of beans. It makes it very cost effective, and that's a big advantage about delivery in Harvest Plus. That's what we do consider. We also do consider, for example, um, in basically in uh, commercial marketing that, that hybrids are released in several countries, and you have regional agreements. When hybrid is released in one country, 
can be easily released or be variety in another country. And these agreements exist in Southern Africa and also in, in West Africa and also in Asia. For example, there is an agreement which includes uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal and India. And so we are considering also that. And uh, again, related to Murat's question before, for example, if there was existing hype within a private company expands to one country, then this operational costs are very cheap, the partners are in place. But we always need, and this is key, and that's the buy-in from the country. So number one is the buy-in. Once you have the buy-in, then again we look at the crop, social, commercial marketing, and so on. And in the business plans about uh, operational, and how to operationalize. I want to say a huge thank you to Keith and Wolf. As you can see, they've not only put a huge amount of effort in developing the last 12-month tool, but they also put a huge amount of effort in, in bringing that to you in a, in a fabulous presentation. And I want to thank uh, Ekin Barol as well, the, the director of the, the team in which uh, Keith's work resides, because she's been a big champion for this work from the start. So we hope this stimulates an ongoing conversation. Um, as we said, this has probably been the hardest part of the strategic planning process. We want to engage with you, our partners and donors, and, and anyone who, who wishes to, to take, this, take this journey with us. Um, so please keep your questions coming. Um, you can contact directly Wolf or Keith or myself, and we can share those questions with the team. And uh, please share this webinar. We'll send you the link of the recording. And please share it with colleagues that maybe didn't have a chance to dial in live. But thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let's uh, all look forward to a very productive 2018. And let's hope that we can now go and deliver the, the nutrition benefits, the livelihood benefits, and the health benefits to the communities that are actually living in these, these gray areas in this big world map. Thank you very much, team. Thank you.